Good morning and a very warm welcome to our morning worship here in Peterhead Congregational Church. We welcome you wherever you're joining us from this morning and we pray that the Lord will bless us all as we meet um, and worship him in spirit and in truth. I have some intimations that are required to read this morning. Uh, firstly, to remind you that next Sunday the, the, the church will reopen for public worship. That will be at 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. And there's uh, the letters already out to you. So you know that from Monday you can contact either the church secretary or myself and book a place for the service next week. And there will be an overflow into the large hall as well. So that's um, next Sunday our, our public worship will will be resumed we will continue to uh, stream our services at 11 o'clock and we'll begin streaming our evening services at six o'clock so both services will be available on youtube the bible study will start um well next week the bible study will be as normal um uh, on youtube and then on the 26th of the month then we'll open the Bible study so that members of the congregation and others who wish can attend that also. The deacons court have made that decision and they've decided also, of course, that DVDs will be distributed as they've been distributed to everyone who wants them. So there'll be no difference in what we're doing, but the difference will be that people will be able to physically come and be part of the worship. Um, and I have an intimation about our AGM. The annual general meeting of Peterhead Congregational Church will take place on Tuesday the 18th of May at 7.30pm in the church. The meeting will be live streamed on YouTube. The accounts for the year ending the 30th of August 2020 will be laid before the congregation. Copies can be uplifted from the halls on Tuesday mornings between 10 a.m. and 11.30 and on Thursday evening between 6 and 8. You can also request a copy by email from the church treasurer. There will be no any other competent business, AOCB, from the floor of the meeting, but items can be sent in writing to the church secretary or email the minister by 12 noon on Monday the 17th. If you wish to attend the AGM, it will be necessary to book a place and we ask you to phone the church secretary or phone or email the minister to reserve your place. And can we also intimate that the deacon's court will meet on Tuesday evening in the church at 7pm. That's the deacon's court this coming Tuesday at 7pm. I believe that's all the intimations other than to thank all those who turned out in force on Wednesday to come and assist with the cleaning of the church. The church looks beautiful and smells like a big bottle of flash lemon and it's lovely and fresh and we thank everyone for their efforts and for their time and for their hard work in indeed responding to that. The psalmist writes, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. Let's worship God and sing to His praise and His glory our first hymn, The World Was in Darkness, in sin and shame, mankind was lost, and then Jesus came. The words are on the screen.
Let's pray together. Let's all pray. God our Father, we come here indeed giving thanks for you. For out of the darkness and the sin and the shame of this world, you spoke and your whole creation came into being. You spoke and that which was formless and dark became light and took shape according to your will. We thank you, Lord, that even today you continue to speak and you continue to change, to recreate and to bring new creation into the life of men and women and children all over this land and this world. We thank you for the continuing work of the gospel, for that work that goes on in spite of us. And we thank you, Lord, that all the schemes of men cannot frustrate your plan, that your will and your purpose are ever worked out. As we gather before you this morning, we would firstly seek to confess our sins. We would confess that we have sinned against you in thought and word and by our deeds. O oh Lord, in so many ways, we forget that you have claimed our lives in so many ways we can wander, be it in our thoughts or, or in any other way. And so we pray that you would help us to stop our wandering and to focus our attention on you and on you alone. We would confess that there are many times when we are too busy looking at the things of this world instead of looking to you, the author and finisher of our faith. So, gracious God, as we wait on you, as we turn our whole attention to you and to your word of truth, so we earnestly pray that you would touch our hearts and our lives this night. Lead us into repentance of our sin. And through repentance, may we know the richness of your love and your forgiving us, rest forgiveness restoring us and setting us before you. Help us to walk in that narrow and straight path that leads directly to you. And help us at every moment of the day and night to be ever ready and ever willing to confess the faith that lies within us. Gracious God, we pray now that you will be in every part of our worship today as we sing your praise as we speak to you in prayer as we read your word as we share that word together may all we do and all we say glorify your holy name and glorify the precious name of jesus christ your son our lord in whose name we dare to ask this. Lord God, we thank you for your word of truth. Lead us and guide us in it. We ask all of this in Jesus' name who taught us to pray together as one family and to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Now we would sing again um, in our next hymn, More About Jesus Would I Know More of His Grace to Others Show. The words are on your screen. Scripture reading this evening is taken, or sorry, this morning is taken from um, Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus to Ephesians chapter 4, and we will read from verse 17. Ephesians chapter 4, and reading from verse 17. Hear the word of God. 
So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality and as so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbour, for we are all members of one body. In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, just as in Christ, God forgave you. And now we'll go into chapter 5, just the first two verses we're going to read. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Amen. And may the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his word. And to his name be all glory and praise. As we come to our prayers of intercession, we remember, we continue to remember those who, who need our prayers at this time. We continue to pray for Charlie and Rosie Morrison, for Helen Milne and our son John in Australia. We remember a young man, a, a family in the church who need our prayers and support at this time. We remember others who also need our prayers and support, uh, who, who want to be private as well. The Lord knows their need. We just need to bring these situations before them. We continue to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ and for the whole nation in India, still undergoing this terrible pandemic. We remember our own land here, the great inroads that are being made, and as things continue to open up, so we pray that people will be careful and cautious in these days. We remember those who are waiting in operations and treatments and, and so many other things, and for all those continuing to work and battle against coronavirus not so far away, just along in Moray, we know how there's, 
there's big problems there at the moment with an increase in coronavirus that's what nine times what it is in our own area here and and so while the work's being done to try and bring that under control so we're not out of the wood yet and we continue to need uh, as we always need to be in prayer before our gracious God. Let's pray together. God our Father, we thank you for all that's being done to help us through this time of, of coronavirus. We thank you that every day in, in our, our, the United Kingdom, half a million people are being vaccinated. People in our own town and all the time more and more younger folk and others coming back for second doses. And we thank you, Father, for the protection that's been afforded and indeed for the news that boosters will be given to protect the population. We thank you for all that's been done because we can clearly see your hand in the midst of all of this. Lord God, we do remember those who continue to work in hospitals battling against this coronavirus. We, we pray for those in nursing homes uh, and, and, and care homes where it's still difficult to get in and, and see people and, and where they're so afraid that there could be an outbreak. And we, 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 as we said, we would pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ and Mori not far away from us at all. And, and there, the, the, the massive increase in numbers very quickly, and we pray that that will be brought under control, that everything that can be done is being done, and that people will adhere to the rules that are in place. We pray, Father, for those whose task it is to police our land at this time. They have a difficult job. For those working in, uh, as carers and social workers and home carers, everything is so difficult for our shopkeepers, for everyone doing their best to provide for, for themselves and for everyone else. And we pray, Father, that you would continue to bless us now, Father. We would also pray now for our services next Sunday. As we open up and as we start to meet together, we thank you that we're able to do that. And we know that it's not the ideal, the way in which we have to meet, but most importantly, we are witnessing to the truth of the gospel. And we thank you to everyone who has helped us to do this. Those who have come and, and carried out the necessary um, check on us, those who have done work to allow us to get in, those who have come and cleaned, those who are busy planning, we, we, everyone who's had a part to play, we pray your blessing on us all. And as you would reach out to bless us, Father, so we earnestly pray that we will also seek to adhere to the regulations and the rules that are laid before us for the benefit of all of us. Lord God, we would remember before you the terrible situation in India, the terrible virus that's 400,000 people a day are, are catching this illness. Lord, for all those who are working, for those folk who are trying to manufacture oxygen quicker than, the, than, they, than it can, you know, it's being used up as soon as it's made, and Father, we just put that whole situation before you and we pray that in, in your grace and mercy you would meet the needs of that land at this time. We remember our brothers and sisters in Christ all over that country 
and we pray for them at this time as they seek to continue to witness to the gospel. We pray for the life and the witness of the church as we take these tentative steps back to some kind of normality. And we pray that as we meet, Lord, that we will all be happy and willing to, to, to play our part in, in all that we have to do. Be near to us. Help us not to be concerned that, and, and help us to know that, that we'll all be shown to where we need to be, that the deacons are fully conversant with all that needs to be done. And bring your peace and your calm upon our hearts and help us to come to this house this coming Lord's Day joyfully to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ in churches and meeting halls all over our town. We pray that there too, wherever your word is being sent forth, that your blessing and your hand would rest upon them. For our families, for our friends, we pray. For our local funeral director and his staff, we, we pray. For our neighbours round about us. For those who might be thinking that maybe they would like to come to church this coming Sunday. Maybe folk that don't normally come. Help them to come. Help them to know that they will be made most welcome here. Gracious God, fill our hearts and our minds with your love and your peace. Bring your peace to bear upon each one of us and enable us to wait upon you. Now in a moment's silence, we would bring our own prayers and petitions to you. gracious and holy God. We pray that you would hear all our prayers, those that we've spoken, those that we've whispered in our hearts. We ask them all in and through the precious name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Now the hymn before the sermon. The hymn before the sermon, praise to the holiest in the height and in the depth be praised. The words are on your screen.
pray together. God our Father, we thank you that even as we sing the words of that hymn, praise to the holiest in the height, that as we raise our voices in praise to you, that you would draw near to us even now and touch our hearts and our lives as we open up your word in this time. Bless this word to our hearts, for we would ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we, we looked, and the week before we were in Ephesians chapter 1, and, and I felt that called and drawn to this passage tonight, um, which begins at verse 17 of chapter 4 and just goes in to those first two or those first two verses of chapter 5 because of the instruction that those two verses give us at the end of this. We'll come to that in, in a few minutes. Now when a minister says a few minutes that means at the end of the sermon so it'll be more than a few minutes but it always helps to take you through the time you see. So as we read this, the Apostle Paul's in full flight is speaking to this um, Ephesian church. And you'll remember from last week how we spoke and said that Paul was ever interested in the unity of the church, the unity of believers. That was what was important to him. And we know from reading the scriptures that when a house, when a, a place, when a, a congregation of the church of Jesus Christ is divided, then what happens is that congregation falls. Because they're not all walking in the one direction, looking to the one saviour, looking indeed to the will of God in our midst. And so as we come to this passage, then we're reminded of that need to continue to walk in the light and in the love of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. If in your own time you read the opening part of this chapter 4, from 1 down to 16, then everything that's written there is about the, the unity of, of the of the. Of the of the church and the unity of the body of Christ and that unity is all important here. Now as we come to this passage the first thing that we are told about he says so I tell you this and insist in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Now when he speaks of Gentiles remember he speaks of those who are outside of the faith it's just a word it, it often says in, in Paul's letters he'll speak of the Greeks that's because the Greeks had a, a belief system that um, was based on knowledge secret knowledge like like Gnostics and he would they would have this um, understanding that was based on them and, and all the religions and gods that they had and that's why Gentiles is a broad name for everyone who's away from God. And so he says, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you no longer live as the Gentiles do. Now, he then goes on to speak down to the end of verse um, 19. And as he speaks, what he's giving us is he's speaking about the condition of the world in which we live in a world that does not know who the saviour is and because the world doesn't know who the saviour is then all the priorities in their lives are put before god god's way 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 down the list if his name even appears on the list for many and so when Paul writes this, he writes saying to them, you know, the, he says, um, and insist on it 
um, in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their mind and understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. So there's the thing that causes the distance between man and God, the hardening of the heart. That is when the heart no longer wants to hear God. That is when all the things that are around us become more important than God himself and we end up turning away to face all these things. All the things that would make our lives even more hard. You know, making our hearts such that they are like stone. Whereas what God seeks to do is to take hold of our heart and make it malleable, make it workable, make it soft so that we can understand him and understand his will and understand his purpose. But when we harden our hearts against God, we are putting up that barrier that pushes him further and further away or perhaps what I should say is it puts up a barrier that pushes us further and further away from God because God is always near. It is we who wander away and stray. He doesn't, he doesn't run away. He's around us, within us at all times. But if we have no room for him, then we push him out of our lives. Often the church choir um, on a Sunday morning, and when we're able to sing, God willing, that won't be that long, then the church choir will be back up front here, starting the service with a, an intro on a Sunday morning. And one of the, the songs that I love to hear them sing is the, an old Sankey hymn, Have You Any Room for Jesus? Reminding us of the need to give Christ space in our whole being so that we can exist. And as Paul speaks here, he, as I say, he's speaking about the moral condition of the world. The world that accepts everything and wants everything. That will trample over the top of the needs of others so that everyone can get what they want. And that's not the way of God. Because the way of God is to treat us all with his love and his grace and his gentleness. Even although we in ourselves are not worthy of that, nonetheless, because of his love for us, he lavishes us with his grace that provides for us in every conceivable way he says in verse 19 having lost all sensitivity they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more the world in which we live is a callous place where greed is at the heart of so many people's lives Wanting, wanting, wanting. I remember, I say that, I remember my father and I going on holiday to Turkey. And we stayed in this hotel and we would go and we would have our meal at night and there was these folks sitting at a table next to us. And it was always one of you to go to the buffet. And these folk would come back with, I'm, I kid you not, several plates of food heaped up yon height for each one of them. And it was as though they'd never seen food in their life before. And, and almost two-thirds of that would end up in the bin because it was far too much. But you see, they were paying and therefore they wanted everything that was there, even although they weren't going to eat it. And then we wonder why it is that there are folk across our world who don't have anything to eat and who are in need Gluttony and, 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 and desire like that does not come from an understanding of God. It comes from a desire 
within ourselves a hardening of our hearts. So therefore, what is it that the Church of Jesus Christ has to do? <clears throat> because we're given this really important information here. How the hardening of hearts turns people away from God. So the task, therefore, of the Church of Jesus Christ is to take the gospel and to reach out with that gospel so that the hearts of all might be softened. Revive, what is it the old Sankey hymn says? Oh, revive the hearts of all. And so we are, we are being called to reach out with the gospel so that hearts are made soft and, and come to a better understanding. And how do we learn that? Well, from verse 20 down to, to verse 24, Paul teaches us how to do that and what it is that we are to do. He says, you, however, did not come to know Jesus Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is Jesus. So teaching is important. How do we learn to read? How, you know, in our, our youngest days, I can't remember that far back, I think it's too far away now. How do we remember how to read? How do we remember how and, and learn how to count? How do we remember all the things that we are able to remember from our, our, our childhood. You know, in those early days when you start to, to spell, when you start to write, when you start to count, when you have all this knowledge pouring in. And the fact is, that's how it is when we come to Jesus Christ. The day that we accept the Saviour, as our Lord and Saviour, that doesn't mean that we instantly know all about him. We just know who he is and that he's touching our lives. Then comes the task of learning about him. We sang that hymn today, more about Jesus. Would I know? I, what does that mean? We would put that, turn that round the other way. That first line says, I want to know more about Jesus Christ. And that, of course, should be exactly where we are as the Church of Jesus Christ, always wanting to know more and taking that into our lives. Surely you have heard of him and we are taught in him in accordance with the truth that is Christ week by week. The sending forth of the gospel. Day by day, you and I lifting up our Bibles to read the Word of God. That's how we are taught. God is our teacher. He has given us in his Word absolutely everything that we need so that we can understand his will and learn of him. He's teaching us here how we can take the message out. He's reminding us that one day we didn't know him, just like so many folk in the world outside today who don't know who Jesus Christ. He says in verse 22, You were taught with regard to your former way of life. He's reminding us that one day we lived as the world lived, and then because we came to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, we were called to, like a jacket, take off our old life and lay it down and put on our new jacket, our new coat, a new understanding. That was our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in him alone. And that message is, is important for us because it reminds us that we're not standing in judgment over people. We were where the world is today until God in his grace and mercy reached down and touched our lives when we were in the, the mud and the mire as the psalmist would speak of. And he lifted us up and set our feet upon a solid rock and put a new song in our mouths as the psalmist writes. 
how important it is for us to remember that we are being called not just to meet and, and, and read the words of the hymns and, and, and read the scripture and listen to the minister, but to put our faith into action today for the sake of the gospel. We are to be made new in the attitude of our minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That's the goal, you see, that you and I are to become every day more like Jesus. Hence the reason I say again we sung that hymn, more about Jesus would I know. Just as we sung that hymn, praise to the holiest in the height, to that beautiful old tune that reminds us of all that God has done for us. All the things that we couldn't do for ourselves. We can't save ourselves. We can't take ourselves to heaven. We can't do anything like that for ourselves. But God can do it. Absolutely every bit of it. And he does it in our lives. Every single day. As he reaches down to you and me. What a gracious God it is. Who bends low. To touch our lives. To bring us nearer and closer to him. We're reminded in verse 25 in the next section. Of all the things that we have to do. We're to put off um, falsehood and speak truthfully to our neighbour. We're not to be angry. We're to be willing to forgive each other. We've to resist the devil, the most important thing we can do, because he's the one who comes and whispers in our ear, ah, that's, you don't need to do that, you don't need to do this. Don't listen to what was said in the church yesterday or the day before. Don't listen, because you know it's not how it is. We know that that's what he does, because right at the beginning of the scripture, Right at the very start in the book of Genesis, in the opening chapters, what did he say? Of course you can eat from the tree and the fruit of the garden. It won't do you any harm. And what it did was bring sin into the world. And he needed sin to come into the world and the whole creation fell. Now when Christ comes again, then the scripture says the whole creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. The whole creation, we are waiting for the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ to counter the work of Satan. But Satan's at work everywhere, always trying to take us in the wrong direction, always trying to take us away from the very things that we know and we value. It says, he has been stealing much, steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands. We're being reminded that you and I must have work to do. What kind of work? Something that we can do for the Saviour. Something that will lift us into the presence of God. We're told that we're to watch our speech. We're not to be wanting or using the wrong kind of speech. Evil speech, it says. We're to watch our language. We shouldn't be sitting in the church one day and cursing like a tripper out in the street the next day because fresh and salt water cannot flow from the same stream and what we show ourselves to be when we do that is that we're hypocrites that we do not know who Christ is that's the truth of that there's no room in our lives for foul language when we make the claim that we belong and that we love the Lord Jesus Christ we're reminded that our speech should be of spiritual talk. 
that we should always want to talk about the Saviour. We have an elderly lady, and boy have I missed her coming through the door of this church every Sunday morning. As she walks through the arch doorway outside, she would always say, how good it is to come to the Lord's house to worship. And come in with a smile on her face and sit down and when we sing our hymns with a smile on her face. Why? Because she loves the Lord. And she has a desire when you speak to her at any time to witness to the truth of Jesus Christ. And I'm sure every person here knows who that is without me saying her name. Evil speech is not for us. Malice is not for us. Instead, what we are to do, in verse 32, we are to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. And here's the crunch line. Just as Christ, just as in Christ, God forgave you. We sometimes don't want to forgive other people. Or we might say that we forgive and we don't. And yet, you and I, if we are in Christ, have been forgiven for every single sin that we committed in this life of ours. Everyone blotted out. And yet, so easily, we will accuse others. So easily, we forget what it is that God has done for us. And we're being reminded here that we are to be willing to forgive. Now, the last, the first two verses of chapter 5 will bring this sermon to a close. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now I tell you, there's enough for a whole sermon in those two verses and maybe even a couple of sermons because it's packed with stuff, packed with information for us. Be imitators of God. Who are we to imitate? Who who are we to look to? Who are we to follow? We are to follow the path of God. We are to look to Jesus Christ so that we might follow in his footsteps. But not just walk in his way, but live in his way and be in his way and treat others as he treated others and treat others as he treated us. That's what we're being asked to do, to imitate, imitate God, to do everything according to the nature of God, so that as we, we, we follow him, we become his disciples. It's a call to discipleship that's here. He says, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. How great, how vast, how wide is the, the, the love of God? How vast is that? Because the reality is the love of God is beyond all our comprehension. It is the love that one day out of the blue, perhaps, the Saviour called your name and took you out of the things of this world and brought you into a new life in Jesus Christ. It is so vast that that love promises us an eternity with our God in the presence of of our Lord and Saviour. That's a fraction of the love of God in Christ. And that's been exposed to us. We, we've been exposed to that love. We've been touched 
by that. And yet, how can it be then if we have hate in our hearts for other people? Once again, we cannot love and hate at the same time. Once again, salt and fresh water cannot flow from the same spring. In other words, we, if we hate one and love the other, we are denying Christ in all that we do. Now, the call to love is all important. And that's the answer here. That's why we read this two verses. I read it again. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave up for us as a fragrant offering. The sweet smelling fragrance of the dying Christ. A fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. The free, the sweet smelling offering of a dying Jesus Christ. Because that sweet smell, that offering, that precious gift was given for you and for me so that we could be in Christ. That's what's important here. You see, it is love. Back to what we spoke of earlier, how the latter part of this was to teach us how to soften hardened hearts. How do we soften hardened hearts? With the love of Jesus Christ. But remember this. We can't just speak about the love of Jesus. We have to show it to each other. In our deeds, through our actions, through our speech, through our life. We have to show him forth in all that we would do. The call today, therefore, is a call for all of us to take up that discipleship call of the Saviour and seek to follow him and seek to belong to him and seek to give him all honour in our lives and to take the love of Jesus Christ with us wherever we may go. Shall we pray together? God our Father, help us this day and every day to take the love of Christ with us. Help us to, to walk towards Jesus every day. Help us to put our hope and our trust in him every day. For we ask it in his precious name. Amen. We would conclude our service by singing our closing hymn, Only a Step to Jesus, then why not take it now? The words are on your screen.
upon your homes, upon all whom you love in this place and elsewhere, this day and for evermore. <laughs> 